Welcome, please, Mr. Tim Knox. Good morning. Uh, my name is Tim Knox. I have the honor to be the director of the Center for Policy Studies. Uh, we start with some words of welcome from Mark Berliat and Maurice Sarchi, the chairman of the Center for Policy Studies, if they'd like to come to the stage now. Good morning. I'm Mark Berliat, the chairman of the City of London Policy and Resources Committee, and it's my great pleasure to welcome you to the Guildhall, the historic home of the City of London for many hundreds of years, very traditional in many respects, but at the heart of the world's largest financial centre, a tribute to open and free markets. The Centre for Policy Studies was founded to advance markets and liberty by Margaret Thatcher and Keith Joseph. And on a personal note, I'm delighted to be here because well over 30 years ago, I had the pleasure of working with Sir Keith Joseph on a number of policy issues and learned a great deal about the policy-making process as well as about the importance of markets and liberty. The goals of free markets and of liberty have been very largely but not universally achieved. The value of free markets is now pretty universally accepted by policymakers. At the other end of town, there's another conference going on today about China, an economy which has achieved rapid economic progress with systems that proponents of free markets might not find to their liking. But now China is having to give attention as to how to make its markets freer because it knows that it has to to make further economic progress. Any discussion of free markets inevitably leads to that great political question in Britain today about membership of the European Union. The view of the business world in Britain, not just the city, is that Britain needs to be in the European Union and fully engaged. But the more important issue is what sort of European Union do we want? In Britain, we want a European Union based on free markets that is open and competitive within those markets and to the rest of the world. We have a general election coming up in Britain shortly, and we have a referendum before that, and we've just had some elections to the European Parliament. And at any time when there are elections, it is wise and helpful for the proponents of free markets to debate and evaluate the role that those markets play in economic prosperity. This conference gives a great opportunity to do that, and I'm sure that that opportunity will not be wasted. You will indeed have a most productive, valuable, and I'm sure enjoyable day. It now gives me great pleasure to hand over to Lord Satchi. Thank you all. Well, what a, what a gathering this is. Yesterday, the CPS um, issued the over 900th security pass for this conference. So what an honor this is to see you all here. It's a, it's a remarkable group. What, a, what an honor for the Center for Policy Studies and what a tribute to Mrs. Thatcher. Thank you all very much indeed for, for being here. I must thank first Mark Boliat, who you've just heard from, who, whose place this is and who has loaned us this marvelous palace for, for today. We're very grateful to him and to his team who have been wonderful in working with the CPS over the last month or so about this conference. I also want to thank flat out the, um, the Templeton Foundation who have played a key part in developing some of the work you're going to see that the CPS is carrying out and of course our two media partners, the Daily Telegraph in the UK and the National Review in America. Thank you so much, you've made all this possible. I think you can all see for yourselves that the Centre for Policy Studies has remarkable convening power. And we have brought us all together into this great room, poets and prime ministers, ambassadors and auditors, bishops and generals, economists and editors, journalists and judges. And we've, we've brought you here to address um, one question which I'm, going to, which I'm going to put to you. Perhaps I could start like this. Forty years ago, um, 
Mrs. Thatcher was in the original office of the Centre for Policy Studies, sitting on the floor, as, her, as is explained by her brilliant biographer, Charles Moore, who's speaking later today. And as he describes it, she was sitting on the floor and she was changing the plug on the kettle. But in fact, as he says, she wasn't wiring a kettle. She was rewiring conservatism. And she must have done a very good job with her wiring diagram on the reds and the blues. She didn't need the brown, apparently, because the end result 40 years later is that you can go anywhere in the world and tap anyone on the shoulder and say, what did Mrs. Thatcher believe in? And you'll get a flat out straight answer. Nowadays, it's, things aren't quite so straightforward. The, the, this came to us as a revelation after our brilliant director, Tim Knox, went to all the party conferences and listened to the closing perorations by the three um, party leaders. And he came back to the CPS and reported that not one of them had used the words freedom or liberty at any point in their speeches. So we would like to see if we can address the question of why that, what, how that came about, that nobody's interested, in these, nobody's interested in these two words, apparently. We all know that we went off, even though people liked socialism originally, we went off socialism on the grounds that it didn't produce any money. Then we liked capitalism, but now apparently we've gone off that also on the grounds that it produces too much greed and too much worship of the golden calf, which is probably the reason why in those um, polling surveys that you see, when you go behind the numbers, and the, this is in the sort of standard polling question, which party has the best policies on? Whatever it is, the schools or the hospitals or the crime or the police or whatever. It, usually, the most common answer is neither. So um, in an attempt to deal with Tim's discovery at these party conferences, um, I did what everybody does, which is to go and search in Google. So I searched freedom in Google. Freedom is a software utility designed to allow a person to block their own access to the internet for a set period of time. Marvellous. I thought I'd try Liberty. Liberty is the leading international cable company with operations in 13 countries. We provide TV, broadband, internet, telephony services, etc., etc. So then I thought, okay, not, not Google, I'll try YouTube. And on YouTube, on Liberty, I found this. In this battle, we have fought for the cause of liberty. Should we do that once more? In this battle, we have fought for the cause of liberty. So if I could bring um, a former Nobel Prize winner in literature into the room, um, T.S. Eliot, he would have said, looking at those Googles and that film, um, that is not what I meant at all. That is not it at all. And so if that's not it, then this conference is going to figure out what it is. And to open this conference and set it on its way, thanks to um, dear Geordie Gregg here, I am going to hand you over, and what an honor this is for me, I'm going to hand you over from one Nobel Prize winner in literature, T.S. Eliot, to another Nobel Prize winner in literature, Sir V.S. Nepal, who will perhaps now join us. This is the opening line of one of his masterpieces. The world is what it is. Men who are nothing, who allow themselves to be nothing, have no place in it. Well, Mrs. Thatcher is not nothing, and Savidia Nepal is not nothing. So may I present to you, ladies and gentlemen, the only living 
British winner of the Nobel Prize for Literature to open the Thatcher International Conference on Liberty, Sir Vidya Nepal. Freedom and democracy. Please let me know whether you can hear me. Is it all right? Good. Freedom and democracy are words which are hard to avoid in any discussion of the principles of government. They're easy enough to understand, but hard to define. The best definition I can think of comes from Mrs. Thatcher. She said of her principles of governing that she was concerned with freedom within the law. Anyone who shares her high idea of civilization and humanity will understand what she means. But the good words also bring a further question. <coughs> Whose law are we talking about? The world is full of cultures, and every culture might have its own idea of fairness and legality. In 1979, at the time of the Iranian Revolution, there are romantic people here who, playing only with the name, thought the new Iranian society, being revolutionary, might have had the good qualities that revolutionary societies were thought to have. In fact, the truth was different, as I found when I went to Iran at that time. I had been staying in the United States, vaguely connected with a university. It happens sometimes to writers in their times of idleness. Of the television news about Iran and the Ayatollah Khomeini excited me, and I understood I had been given an idea for a book in the most accidental way. I thought I should make a... a journey of inquiry or learning in the non-Arab Muslim world. It was an accident that I thought of traveling to the non-Arab world. This is because the television news was conditioning my response to Iran and the, and the Muslim world. Muslims were at once close to me and far away. I had always been aware that Muslims are part of the small Indian community I had been born into. And it could be said that I had known Muslims all of my life, but I knew little of their religion. My background was Hindu, so to speak. I have to put it like that because I really had no faith. I grew up only with a half knowledge of the religions of India. I knew that Muslims, though ancestrally of India, and though like ourselves in many ways, were different. I was never instructed in the religious details of the difference. And perhaps no one in my family really knew. I barely understood the many rituals and ceremonies of my grandmother's house, which I had grown up with. Religion wasn't part of the intellectual formation of my mind, though tradition and ritual regulated the wider life of our family. I feel I have to say this here. To make it clear that I did my Islamic travel with an open mind, though the news from Iran in these early days was not good. The news of that time was full of was still of executions. The official new <coughs> the official Iranian news agency kept count and gave a new grand total of bad people killed. A strange proceeding, but perhaps the idea was to show how benign the new society was. I had no idea that I would soon be looking from my hotel room at the prison with the sinister blue exit gates where the executions took place. 
It was not a view I would have chosen. The most recent executions had been of prostitutes and brothel, ma brothel managers. The revolution had taken that bad turn. The Ayatollah Khomeini was reported to have outlawed music and Islamic rules were being enforced again. Mixed bathing had been banned. Revolutionary guards, semi military guardians of the revolution, watched the beaches of the Caspian Sea resorts and separated the sexes. How did the definition of freedom within these harsh laws come about? Religious beliefs has supplied many, most civilizations with their, ethical, with their ethical code. Hinduism and its offshoot Buddhism, though full of contradictions, nevertheless gave civilization the doctrine of karma and the idea of consequence. In my own upbringing, there's no simple idea of doing unto others as you would have them do to you, which is dazzling to me when I, when I first heard it, and it still remains a perfect guide to human behavior. Religious laws may have been liberating and gave order to societies, but they quickly became oppressive and acted as a break to the freedom of thought. A defiance of the religious way of seeing gave the civilization science, and through science to technology, whose unstoppable ideas we live with and by. The concept of democracy, as the word itself testifies, was born of the Greeks. Their classical literature and classical mathematics speak of the growth of civilization that accompanied their their orators and politics, but they kept slaves. Such contradictions occur in all civilizations, and these contradictions must not be used to denigrate the culture from which they came. It is important to remember that where there is free interplay of ideas, the good can often overcome the bad. The British Slave Owning Society produced Wilberforce, the passionate abolitionist. The British not only abolished slavery by statute, they also found the money to compensate the slave owners who had lost the services of their slaves. They did this right through the Caribbean. Even little Antigua, no one lost. The compensation paid varied with the value of the slaves. In Antigua, slaves were valued at 14 pounds per head. After visiting Iran, I journeyed through a number of Islamic lands, including Malaysia. They were decolonized now. It could be said that the Malays had won their political battle against the Chinese, and they were looking for an identity. They were desperate to rid themselves of the past and desperate to stamp out ancient tribal or animist practices among the, their people. All the subconscious life freighted with the past that links people to the earth on which they walk, all the rich folk life that awakened people elsewhere, cultivated and dredged for its poetry. They wished the more earnest of these Malay Muslims to be nothing but their imported Arab faith. I got the impression that they would have liked ideally to make their minds and souls a blank, an emptiness, so they could be nothing but their faith. On my return to Malaysia, 16 years later, I found that Islam had triumphed and the lot had changed. A young lawyer I met on this second journey 
stroke of his ambition <coughs> to return to the simplicities and the certainty of the earlier faith. He said of that faith, it has been laid aside. It has been replaced by an idea of the Malays as a trading and manufacturing people. These are words that would not have been associated with Malays in the past. I could see that the government had done all it could to bring Malays into business, and over the last three generations, it had succeeded. The racial anxieties of 16 years before, the worry about the Chinese, had been swamped by the new wealth. New men had been created by both sides. This was the message of the steel, concrete and glass around the Holiday Inn, where I had stayed 16 years before. It was then an isolated tall building. The young lawyer I was speaking to was more worried about the forest highway than about the changes in the town. He said poetically of the highway, I think it telescopes time. It was an arresting way of describing a physical development, and he was saying many things. He was disturbed by the effect the highway would have on the rural life of Malay villages. He was worried about the apparent triumph of the Chinese and the way of dealing with the land. So what looked like a racial point was something much bigger. It was a rejection of the modern values that seemed about to become universal in its simplest way. This rejection was a rejection of modern goods and modern machines. With these modern tools, there had also come modern ideas which not everyone could comprehend. The most important idea that came with those machines and tools was a complicated idea of the pursuit of happiness. It was the idea that made the modern way unbeatable. The pursuit of happiness requires that men are at ease with themselves, at ease with their society and the opportunities their society offers. I find it marvelous to contemplate after two centuries and after the terrible history of the first part of the century that the idea, a mere phrase in the preamble to the American Constitution has come to a universal fruition. It is an elastic idea. It fits all men. It implies a certain kind of society, a certain kind of awakened spirit. I don't imagine my father's parents would have been able to understand the idea. We all know the phrase, but it contains so much. The idea of the individual, the idea of responsibility, choice, the life of the intellect, the idea of vocation and perfectibility and achievement. It is an immense human idea. It can be said to contain the world. It cannot be reduced to a fixed system. It cannot generate fanaticism. But it is known to exist, and because of that, other more rigid systems, even when religious, in the end blow away. Mrs. Thatcher made little of this directly, but she might be said to be the champion of this brand of human happiness. Thank you.